and you are now live. Brilliant. Thank you, Asha. Welcome everyone to this evening's FBS chat. Um, I already know it's going to be fun because we've had a little chat behind the scenes. Uh, so yeah, welcome to Frank, our special guest, Frank Thomas from Fort Worth, Texas or near Fort Worth, Texas. Thank you, Frank. Uh, really pleasure to have you with us. Hayson from Canada, one of our old friends. Thank you, Hayson. John Wheeler from the north of England. So we are <laughs> truly international. Um, so I always start off, Frank, is um, how you came across solution focused uh, brief therapy and how did you know it was the right fit or did you not at the time? I don't know. I thought you were going to ask me about where I started off. I started off as a child, very small, mm -hmm. yeah. very young, <laughs> very young as well. Yeah. Uh, my first introduction to solution focused brief therapy was in 1985. Uh, Steve DeShazer walked up to me at a party in New York City and handed me his business card. And he sort of stumbled through. I didn't know Steve at the time. He said, well, here's something I'd like you to have. So uh, here you go. And then walked away. And uh, I went, who in the world was that? And my mentor at the time, I was presenting with Brad Keeney, who wrote the in, wrote the, one of the forewords along with John Wakeland to Steve's first book, said that was Steve DeShazer just from your description. You need to go read patterns. You need to go read his book. And so the next week I ordered that book, poor student that I was, I ordered it, got it from Norton and read it. And from that point on, I knew I was with a kindred spirit. I was with someone who knew MRI inside and out, who knew Milton and Erickson inside and out. And those were my roots. Mm. So knowing that my mentor, Brad Keeney, who is a systems thinker and, and very much in the stream of systems thinking, Steve was there. And Steve was talking about things in 82, when that book came out, I guess, 83, that weren't solution focused, but they were talking about patterns that led to his ideas. So when he left and went to, back to Milwaukee to create this thing that they called the MRI of the Midwest was their first clinic. I just knew I got to follow up with this guy. So in my usual imitable way of introducing myself to people, I walked up to Insu the next time I saw her at a conference in San Francisco and said, I met your husband and this is my encounter with him. And she laughed and laughed and said, oh, that's just so steep. But what I discovered in meeting Insu was the clinical side of the intellectual connection that I had to solution focused. That Steve was not the clinician Insu was. She was the inspiration for a lot of what he wrote. So from that, that point forward, I made friends with uh, Michelle Winter Davis, uh, as good friends from the late 80s, started practicing uh, in the late 80s exclusively with solution focused with a team behind a one way mirror. And Tom Chancellor, who was a social worker at the time, went to Milwaukee since all of us couldn't afford to do it. He did the training, he came back, and we worked together with the team behind the mirror for more than a year to learn this approach. So, this is back, uh, yeah, if you cut off my leg and count the rings, I'm really old. <laughs> back a long ways and i've been as i've been the archivist for solution focused brief therapy and for the bftc part of my work was uh collecting and creating a an archive uh by by uh, sustaining the ideas and preserving the documents and videos from bftc mm. so i did that for five or six years as well so i, I sometimes your memories kind of begin to merge you know, I'm seeing videos of Steve with John Wheeler, or not John, sorry, John, <laughs> no, no. Uh, John Walter, and Steve, and Insu, and Marilyn, and Eve, all in the same videos. And I'm thinking, I was there. Mm. I was there. Black and white videos when they first started. John was there too, I bet. Uh, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take that one. I'll take that one. <laughs> John is now in that memory. <laughs> yeah. So from the very early times of BFTC, uh, I yeah. was um, and I was connected with the, the original group that formed SFBTA. Mm. So my 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 time goes back a long ways. That was a very long answer, but it's no, no. loving, I'm, loving fasc... memories of these people. Fascinating. I'm I'm curious to know um, what was this, what was this event that you were at and. From what I've heard from many people, Steve DeShazer could be quite an awkward person. So what, what made him give his card to you? Um, 
Steve, uh, Bill O'Hanlon once said, the difference between Steve and I is I make eye contact. Mm. Yeah, so Steve was, uh, he would disappear from a dinner. I was out to dinner with Insu and Michael Durant and Steve one time, all of a sudden he was gone. He's walking laps around a parking lot in the rain. Oh, wow. Steve wasn't an odd character. Steve was really Steve. Mm. Uh, and getting used to being around someone who would uh, answer a closed question with no, right? even if it was a long question, it was just getting used to the, the brilliance. And how he connected was through food, through making beer, through talking Wittgenstein. Mm. Uh, why he chose me, I think he knew I was with the Texas Tech group, which was part of Brad Keeney's. Uh, we were all in the same university and presenting together and stuff, and he knew I was with Brad. Mm. Uh, I, I would like to think it's because I was a, a haunting, good-looking man, but <laughs> I don't think that was it. I really don't. It's either you're that good or you're that bad that he had to give you the card. Is that what's happening? That's it. <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed oh, it. man. Yeah. Uh, Hasten, do you have a question for John? For you know, Brian? I do. Oh, I... <laughs> You know, I think when I first heard this thing, MRI, you know, I mean, there are many acronyms that, uh, you know, in my world of uh, work, MRI stands for most respectful interpretations. So it took some time for me to actually get, oh, MRI. So when you talk about you've seen uh, long history, you were there, you sort of really like you saw it grow. And. And I remember attending one of those conferences back then when you were speaking, and that moment is the moment that I I would I was really it was a shocking moment for me. And here's one thing that you said, Frank. You said solution focused is not evolving, but there are many elaborations of it. Do you remember saying that? That was such a profound statement to me. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad you remembered it. Thank you. And I wrote it in my notebook and I kept thinking about it. Really, I still think about it because when I also hear people talking about, oh, solution focus used to be this and we have evolved from it. And I always go back to the statement that you made. Well, instance, Steve, they're already doing it. It's not evolving. It's we are elaborating in different ways. And I find that statement so profound. So if you want to I mean, although you don't remember saying it, but do you still agree with yourself? <laughs> I always say it when somebody reads, by the way, the book is scrolling across the bottom for supervision and it's not important that you read it. It's important that you buy it <laughs> to, for, for hungry children. You know, mine, I'm still you know, <laughs> buying her gifts and things at age 40. Um, I, 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 hold, I hold to it just as strongly now as I did then, even though I don't remember saying that. Uh, if, if we were, evolutions uh, in a Darwinian sense, it would be the most flexible survives. Well, a lot of iterations or evolutions, uh, changes of solution focus has not been the most flexible. They become less flexible. The, the Occam's razor being honored above other things. And it's not a criticism of any particular group or person. It's just that there are many ways that people practice solution focused around the world that are not the way Insu practiced it and developed it with Eve and with Steve and Michelle and Marilyn and Jim and others. I, there's no way that uh, Tomas Schwitek does solution focused therapy the way that I do. But I'm also not judge and juries to say that it's not solution focused. Or Wei Su Su, who practices in Taiwan who wrote a, a wonderful chapter in, in that book uh, about how she practiced the supervision differently because of culture. Uh, yeah, I'm 100% still with it. We have multiple ways to elaborate, but it's not evolving to something better. It's just, as Mark McCurgo called it, 2.0. Uh, to, to me, I would say it's uh, 2.0 in that particular context. But outside of that context, I'm sure there's a 2.0 Hasan. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sure. I know there's a 2.0 John Wheeler because I know John's work very, very well. <laughs> probably a 3.0, probably a 4.0. <laughs> I hope, hope that's responsive, Hasan. Yeah. It's beautiful that you remembered that. I, I'm really honored. John? 
Yeah, so I, I, I hope my question sort of takes you further uh, from that place that Hazen's question has taken you, you know, and um, I know it's a question I've never asked anyone before, and it may be you've, you've never heard this question before, and, it, and that might be because it's, it's a nonsensical question, but we'll see. <laughs> um, um, I was just very, very struck by, you know, you, you saying what you noticed about Insu and Steve. Um, uh, into the clinical side, Steve, the intellectual side, you know, and um, it could have been uh, that people who liked the intellectual aspect entirely followed Steve and people who liked the clinical side entirely uh, followed Insu. Mm -hmm. Had that been the case, once they both died within two years of each other, we would have been in the most enormous mess, <laughs> you know, so somehow or another, uh, there was a synthesis of both of them that came at a brief family therapy center. And what was it that helped to bring the synthesis out so there was less risk of that happening? If that's well, a reasonable no, that's, sort of that's, question. That's a that's a great question. I wish that even Michelle and John and a few others were were on this to to comment because they were firsthand there. Um, I I think what has happened is is that it always remained a team effort. From the very beginning of forming things, Eve was the director of clinical training. Insu was working for money so that Steve could write. I mean, there was very little money at the FTC, and they were seeing clients that really needed to be seen because, like most movements, uh, they were seeing folks who didn't have access to mental health services. And they were working out of a house where the first team would sit on the stairway and listen. Uh, pizza was delivered into the one-way mirror room. So they really took a step up when they moved into the new digs, right? It was a very informal, invite more people in than exclude. Uh, let people experiment. I know people that went there and they were invited to, to comment or to see a client. And they were just, I'm here to be trained. and said, we're here to learn. How is there learning without participation and conversation? Um, I just love that aspect from the very beginning when they were experimenting with ideas like pre-session change. And that beautiful article came out in 86, 87 that had five or six authors on it because they all were a part of that project. So that's why I think it didn't collapse. Um, it wasn't a legacy as much as it was um, people feeling an honest connection to contributing. And that's a beautiful thing for any movement. When Michael White died, narrative therapy continued. And David is still a, a very strong voice. Um, but others have stepped forward, especially in the Adelaide area with, with the group there, uh, especially in Canada, um, especially people like uh, Jim Duvall and others in, in narrative. And so you can see it happening that it doesn't die with the originator. Um, and that's a real honor, I'm sure, to Stephen Insu. Yeah. If they're listening today, they would say, yes, it has to change. This was us. You have different teams. You have different ideas. You have different contexts. So that's a great, that's a great question, John. I wish there were more first, first generation people of being interviewed and asked that question. It happened in Malmo because Brian, Brian Cade was there, Gail Miller, John Wheeler. I think Eve was there. So 11, that was 11, 11 years ago. We yeah. didn't have that. And I've got yeah. video. I've got video of those conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was, sorry. I was, I was really um, thinking about all those. Um, you said you, you, you were looking at the videos behind the mirror and, and, and look, looking through those and archiving those. Um, Did any of them stand out, Frank? What, what was it about those, and how did it affect your work moving forward? That's a great question, Joe. I watched probably 400 hours of video that you can't see because we don't have permission from clients in writing. Mm -hmm. So in archiving it, I had some research assistants that were able to watch them as well. Uh, over, overall, I was impressed by the team, the teamwork that took place where people were simply sharing their ideas from multiple viewpoints. It wasn't an attempt to further something as much as an attempt to be thinking out loud as what might be helpful for the clients. 
it was always focused on who is in the room that's being interviewed and who are we talking about. Uh, I remember Steve sitting uh, in a corner with his head down, uh, elbows on his knees and his head down, while some people were uh, talking more psychoanalytically. And he then just looked up and made a statement saying, well, as I've been thinking about this, you know, per perhaps, and they start talking about exceptions. And that was the first time I'd seen it in these videos. And they didn't all abandon their ideas. They just went, well, that's something we have to consider. I'd never thought about that before. So it wasn't that he was not trumping them. He was just being himself and offering new ideas. They were offering their ideas that would be helpful to the client. And other sessions, they would hear different things. Um, that was really impressive in the team. A lot of those artificial behind the mirror stuff where they would do an interview with Steve and ensue, and then they would see the client for a while and they do another interview. But the ones that I saw where they had, they had video for, for teamwork uh, was very much a, oh gosh, what's the right word? A, a collective of people that didn't all agree. I mean, Gail Miller is not a counselor and he's the first one to say, I'm not a mental health professional. And he was a big part of those teams not just watching and observing, but at asking his viewpoints of things. Uh, so that was that was really marvelous to see them continue to encourage one another to share uh, whatever ideas that might be helpful to the client. And if we develop something for other clients out of this, that's a bonus rather than using them to develop the model. Mm. That's one of my takeaways from this. Though. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, All right. question. Yeah. I, re I remember when we when we spoke to Eve about um, how they would have um, after the client had gone, they would have this conversation around the kitchen table back when it was in in, in a home and that and uh, remembering that sp specifically the interview with a family where they had so so problem saturated that someone who she doesn't remember who said, "Why don't we just ask them what they wouldn't want to change?" And I, it was just so, and, and it yeah. almost, um, I would have loved to ask her when that family came back and said, actually, you know what, we realized that things are, are not as maybe bad as they seem, that there are a lot of strengths, how it kind of developed the approach from there, because we've not had the privilege of meeting the guys that you have. Yeah, and, um, and Lynn Hoffman was the first person I heard talk about the kitchen table talk. Mm -hmm. And and she was kind of transdisciplinary and trans model uh, in a postmodern uh, mindset came up from she was a, uh, deeply in love with Jay Haley and was a part of the group out at MRI. So she knew everyone that we that we talk about. But she would talk about kitchen table talk as being some of the most important informal conversations that develop theory and practice rather than formal training. Yeah. And uh, I, I, honor, I honor that with Eve, too. She talks about the kitchen table, literally the kitchen table. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh. Hey, son, you're shaking your head. It looks like you've got to say, <laughs> so go for it. Like, no, he's wrong. He's wrong. <laughs> no, I love that. It's just so amazing that because, you know, I come from my background in adult education. So I think about how right. people learn. And when we keep on putting these, like, formal learning and after and i often hear from students saying you know when is your next course i'm like stop coming to the courses yes. go out and have conversations go out and have actually practice it have conversations with the people and and really listen to what they seem to care about that's your school that the best school is your client so as I'm listening to you, like those real shifts happen outside of classrooms. And I think one of the things that I highlighted from from the book that, you know, you see actually scrolling on the bottom there is that, you know, there's a part where you're actually describing Insu as like really master of hedging. And in a way that really gives that sense of agency options, like really creating that sense of options. And, and that's something that actually also impacted my work too, as I actually work mm -hmm. with my students and in supervision setting. And I often play with the word supervision, having the super vision to actually notice what's going well. <laughs> so that's yeah. your superpower. Yeah. And in a way, how do we really use that kind of stance of hedging 
so that our mm. students actually leave the room with more options than they actually came in to, to talk to us about. So I would love to also kind of ask you, Frank, you know, in your supervision and working with the students and practitioners and when they come in and kind of like, what do you see as something that you really think that we, we might want to consider that's congruent to the practice itself in our supervision as well as our uh, practice? Mm. Well, um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm thinking uh, it's, it's possible that we're not paying enough attention. I mean, she's laughing because I'm hedging. Um, I'm really not sure. I, I think part of hedging is a is a an assumption that I don't know or I'm very slow to know, and that's a big part of it. Is if people take expertise as a part of their identity and their necessity to contribute, then they lose uh, the ability to create space for people who are novices who are less informed who haven't had the years of experience uh, and so my job as a supervisor is to create space conversational space in a particular area much like um, i remember uh barry duncan who was just talking this week about uh don't go to one more master class <laughs> listen to your clients stop going to master classes so you're in great company and he's in good company too uh, we are terrible judges of how well we're doing. And uh, we just are. The research has, has borne that out. We don't even recognize when people are suicidal about nine out of 10 times if we don't ask. There's people that have a terrible, terrible experiences in counseling, and we think they're doing great, usually twice as good as they say they're doing. So back to the, back to the hedging and supervision, it's how, how wedded am I to my idea that I contribute? Well, I, I am not. I, it's just an idea. So whenever I talk with a person about a, uh, a about one of their clients in supervision, and we we don't have live uh, or video, I'll simply say, how how connected are you to this idea that you have? That this is what did take place. This is what needs to take place. Uh, sometimes scaling it. How how committed are you to this? And it's trying to create not doubt but uncertainty. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because without uncertainty, we tend to become, um, we put it in concrete, we reify it. This is what needs to happen. This is what took place. So most of the time, it's just creating uncertainty in safety. Because if they have to have the answers from me, Professor Thomas, I'm telling about my case. This is not informal. If there's not uncertainty that I welcome and questioning that I welcome of my views, there's, there's no place for them to grow. They're just telling. Now, John, John and I have known each other a long time. Uh, I hope that that's been an experience with John in our conversations. And maybe even ask John to speak to that because as my daughter once said, you're not the expert on how, what kind of a parent you were. You have to ask me. <laughs> that was in a group of people who had said, what kind of a dad were you? So I took a risk and said, okay, how'd I do? She said, pretty good. And I was honored, got a B minus, you know, I was honored. <laughs> But, but John, John, does that resonate with you in some of the, the ways that we've had conversations through the years? Oh, or, certainly. Or, or different, or different. No, 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 it certainly does. And I uh, I suppose where it's, where it's me taking to, it's um, some, oh gosh, you know, the clinical stuff is important. The, you know, the intellectual stuff is important. There's something about the way you are as a person that's important. And, um, that, you know, that's how you are with me mm. and um uh yeah i know <laughs> hey some uh and and um and uh, and uh yeah yeah uh, joe and aisha here i mean we're kind of playing with the we were going to do a workshop weren't we you know which i think speaks about about that you know and we, we can't do the workshop because the, the conference isn't happening the same way now oh. uh but but it but is that what what Hi, sir. Can you remember that that particular? You remember the title of the workshop, or any of you? <laughs> I actually don't have it right here, but I can uh, find okay. it. Okay. Yeah. But but it's it, it's something. It's it embodied. Name. You put the word in, uh, which will come back to me. But it comes from Buddhism, and, it, and it's a particular way of being, uh, where you you know you you are there. You're kind of present, but you're not imposing on others, and you're not sort of making judgments, and you're allowing a space to to exist. Um, and uh, 
and I suppose that you know you know that's that's why I asked you to be my supervisor Frank because I, I you know I, I assumed that you would you know be that way with me and it'd be a space where uh, I'd be free to let my, my thoughts kind of meander and develop and so on and it helped me get the best out of my practice that's right I can, uh, thank you yes equanimity wow. Equanimity, thank equanimity. you. Equanimity, wow, it's a great term, equanimity, and um, yeah. So you know, you, you have that uh, in abundance whenever when I meet with you. Oh, you know, okay. uh, equanimity, and I kind of wonder because you know you, you you referenced before in a you know perhaps hypothetical way if Insu and Steve could watch what's going on now. Um, you know, I kind of wonder. You know, would would they be like delighted to hear scaling questions being asked? Um, uh, would they be delighted to to hear the miracle question be asked? Uh, <laughs> they might be, but is this? It, might it also be there's a certain way that people are with their clients and they are supervisors when they're doing su you know supervision that they they'd be pleased to see and they say, yeah, they've got that, they've got that, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, In Insu and I had an interesting relationship. Um, she asked me to write a book with her, and I said, no. Uh, you don't say no to Insu. <laughs> she didn't talk to me for two years. She, just, she refused to acknowledge me at conferences and stuff. And then finally, somewhere along the line, she decided I wasn't going to beg her to be, be her friend, and we reconciled. Um, she she was the, the person that most of us um, wish we were with clients. Okay, I don't know how to, how to say that well. Um, she, she, of course, when she would say, of course, it was from the heart. Just like when Steve would say, ah, oh, shit. It was from the heart. He would say that, you know, just like, that's a great summary of what this person is, uh, the impact this person is having. But my times with Insu, when you get her away from the, um, promotion because she never stopped working. She called Sarah one time, her daughter on Christmas day and said, get down to work. You know, Ooh. we're going to be working today because Sarah told me that. But such a, a lovely presence that Steve either didn't have the capacity to show or only showed to others that I didn't know. I would never judge, you know, Steve, but Steve wasn't my friend. I knew him. We talked, but, but Insu was a friend of mine. Um, and I think I gained a lot from her, and that's why my focus on supervision is being more like Insu. Uh, we even, Mark Mitchell and I even talked about getting wristbands. I said, W-W-I-S, what would Insu say? Because mm, yeah. when she would say something, you knew it was, it was not always profound, but it was going to be from the heart for the help of the person she was in front of, not because she's trying to demonstrate how brilliant she was mm. or to make a video or anything like that. And I, I, I hope that we have a, uh, enough in our new generation of folks, and I would not put John or me in that, uh, of Hazen and others, and Aisha, I don't, I don't know Joe well enough to mm. whether or not he sees himself in a particular generation, but um, of people that are genuine and open to others' ideas, mm. rather than telling, a lot more conversation. And, and even, even the way from the from the few video clips that I've seen of Insu, even the way she says "Wow" comes across as really heartfelt. That that she really thinks, yes, this was amazing, and I think um, yeah. that that energy between client and helper, I guess, and and the the thing I love about the solution focused approach, and I guess one one of the difficulties in in when we're doing training is. Um, we, we always remain curious about whatever the client comes with, you know, how, how is this a problem for you? Because I don't know, you're a unique individual. Um, and I think, <clears throat> I think people want manuals and patterns and, you know, people to fit into that. And it's really, it's really hard for them to, it's really hard, I guess, for us to get across that. Just go with what the client is telling you. And then you may think, right, this this worked with this client, and you try the question on the next one, and it just doesn't work. It just kind of like falls flat on its head. How do we, how do we persuade people just to remain curious and 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 be open and honest and let the conversation go 
where it needs to go and not worry about the questions. I've got a bank of questions and I need to ask this question. Do you know what I mean? I, I, get, I guess, I, I don't know if that's practice. Is that the energy between the two people involved? Because mm -hmm. I have doubts, Frank. And sometimes you come out of a meeting and you think that was awful. And then they come back and everything's been brilliant. And other times where you think the meeting was great, and they come back and it's all yeah. gone. Yeah. Do you know, do you know what I'm, I'm trying to... Yeah, it's, it's a difficult concept, I think, for some people that have been trained in a particular way of understanding pathology, and, mm. you know, where things should be. So, yeah, just, I don't even know if that was a question, but I, it, I just felt like... <laughs> Are I you love, asking for a friend, Joe? I'm, I'm just, I love, I love this approach. I love it. I love it because I know that every person that sits in front of me is totally unique, regardless of the similar situation that the person before them has come in with. And, 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 and remaining curious. And how do you, how do you train that? How, how do you? Do you know what I mean? Am I making and sense? If, if I actually add to that, um, mm. Joe, earlier, mm. Frank, you talked about how do we create that uncertainty in safety? It's not creating mm. doubts, but creating uncertainty. And, you know, Joe, now you're talking about, I have these doubts. And then, so when people come into you with, you know, could you supervise me or, you know, whatever capacity, how do we actually kind of, what are some ways that we can really assist people to turn from the doubt, that may not be that useful to that space of uncertainty in safety. I think that's something that I would like to add to what Joy is saying as well. So if, if uh, I'm gonna ask, I should just summarize everything that's been said the last five minutes by Joe and uh, Hazel, because uh, I'm sure I'm missing important pieces because I was, I was enamored with what you were talking about, Joe. And then that piece that you added, Hazel, is really critical how but how to do that um i think some of the there there's as steve would always say uh don't think observe mm -hmm. don't think observe so when you're with someone it's being attuned and attentive to the person you're with mm -hmm. so uh in sue i just saw an interview with her with uh, arnold hoggers i'm not sure i'm saying his name right arnold uh and and she said i don't go in with an idea about the client or what i'm going to do and that's still true with me. Um, same with the student coming in. So part of it is, is, is my mind doesn't have uh, predetermined correct answers hmm. or expectations of what they're going to ask me. And I think they get a sense of that. It's not that I'm stupid. You see, I'm not judging them. I'm not coming in saying, this is what needs to take place or this is who you are. And I think they get a sense of that. Uh, Brad Keeney once said, don't ever lie to a client. At some level, they know. Mm. And that has carried on for 40 years with me, nearly 40 years. Mm. Don't, don't ever lie to people. Um, one of the things I think that, that, that helps is for me to have a developmental idea of change is I think it's discontinuous there, there are discontinuous differences between somebody who's just starting something and somebody who's really good at it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Benner did it in nursing, and it's, some of it is, is in this supervision book of saying that people who are beginners, novices, they just want to know the rules, and there's no security at all. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to make mistakes, and I'm going to be look stupid. I'm going to fall on my face. I always say, get in the room, don't throw up, stay the whole hour. It's, it's a success. Okay, that's a success for your first client clients. And um, you don't have to do to do it right, because you can't, there's so many ways of doing it right. Let's talk about your orientation toward them. Let's talk about your posture, your stance, the ideas you have going in, that's what's important. Mm -hmm. So the, there's a 1001 questions, and books like that, uh, I would never have a student read those because if somehow if I memorize this, I'll be better. No, if you memorize that, you have predetermined ideas of what you think is important. And the client is informing what's important, not the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think people should take uh, improvisational theater lessons. Wow. Uh, yeah. I have a student right now that does improv teaching with children and children with special needs. And it's brilliant to have her in a class because her viewpoints of learning solution focus, she says, well, that's kind of similar to what we do with, she has great parallels. Because my, as, as I said, my, my style is improvisational curiosity. I never know what's coming next, but I'm going to play off what you said. Mm. 
that's what therapy is. There's no script. So getting confident that you can come back, not quick witted, just being relaxed enough that you can listen closely, as Guy Shannon says, just that really close listening to notice what's important to the client. Well, it's the same with students. Once they start talking, I'll say, this sounds like to me, hedging to me, this sounds like it's pretty important to you. Mm. And they're free to disagree. But if they do say, yeah, that is important. I just realized that. Well, if that was important, what effect does that have on your listening, on your ability to think after people finish speaking? Mm. Um, there are several skills that people need to learn in order to be counselors. I know I know Steve would not agree, and there are other people that say just you have that relationship with clients. It's a given. You don't have to form it. I think that's nonsense. It, it's, that's a philosophy, but it doesn't fit with research. You know, if people don't join and clients don't believe this is going to be helpful for them and feel hopeful, they don't stay, mm -hmm. they don't come back. Yeah. So unless we are that unique, which I don't mm -hmm. think we are, solution focused isn't God sent or delivered on stone tablets, uh, we're going to have to get into the groove of what a client's believe mm. is, is important. And for uh, for new students, new people learning this, it's shutting up. I give them a small piece of duct tape, just big enough to cover their mouth and say all those that have all those that have mustaches, be careful. This really hurts when you take it off. <laughs> but I'll just hold up my piece of duct tape sometimes when they're in a in, in small groups and they'll look and go, I'm just yakking. I'm just talking. <laughs> it's more important to listen than to talk and to listen closely for what is said, what isn't said, mm. what MRI calls the report and command. It's the words is the report and the relationship and how they use the words. And other people say, no, nah, it's just in the words. No, I don't, I don't believe that. If I say, well, shit. And I say, well, shit, that's a complete, sorry. Is this, it's just my okay. nephews can't watch this anymore. Frank. Oh, yes, they can. <laughs> I, but we've had conversations about sex education with them, so we're good. <laughs> we're good. They are knowledgeable young people. Um, and, but to get a sense from the beginning that your job is to listen closely. Mm -hmm. If you don't get that down, you won't be successful at this. Sure. And I have a student right now who is in AA. And he's in his 50s. He came in and said, I think uh, this is turning my ideas of counseling on, on, on his head. I thought I was supposed to be in and tell people things. Mm. I've been a sponsor for 20 years. I thought that's what this was. And I said, so what are you coming up with now? I didn't say, right. I said, so what are you come up, coming up with now? He says, uh, I need to listen closely to their words. I need to summarize mm. what they're saying so they know I'm following them. I need to, mm. how did you decide to you know, I don't know how you came up with that, but how did you decide to try that rather than just say, screw it, I'll learn it, go through the motions. Mm -hmm. When I get out, I'll do whatever I want. He says, because I see it with my peers when I'm practicing. Mm -hmm. I listen to them in a way that they go, oh my gosh, this person's really listening to me. Mm -hmm. And then it's easy to relax them, which is the skill piece of it. And say, okay, now I just need to listen, not worry about my question. The question will come mm -hmm. from what they've said. And it's, it's a beautiful thing when they begin to just flow with that and say, mm. I'm being helpful to this person. And they gain the confidence from the practice. But practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. Mm. So, so if you practice oh, something. I like that. I'm going to write that down. Uh, that's that's gonna, not original to me. steal that, Frank. She's it's not original that. to me. Mm. But, it doesn't uh, matter. It's now from me. It's now from Aisha. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, her, it's her quote. She owns it. I heard it here first from her. Mm. Um, but, but if you have sex 10,000 times, it doesn't make you a sex expert. It just means you had sex right. 10,000 times. You could be really bad at it. And yeah. since I used to be a sex therapist, I heard a lot of bad sex that was frequent. <laughs> discussed in my sessions. And I'm just going, where did you get the idea that was good sex? Well, I've had sex. I'm going, I don't care how many times you've had sex and how many people. <laughs> That's it for my nephews, really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, 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 I completely get it. And it's, it's so refreshing to hear you say all of this, Frank. And where have you been mm. all I'm my always, life? I'm always All here. my life. Oh, well, I've been married 45 but, years. So that's I, part I of I deliver, <laughs> Joe, Joe, and I, Joe and I deliver a lot of workshops. Um, and social workers are constantly asking, so, so what do you actually do in these workshops? What's the structure of these workshops? 
Do you have a PowerPoint you can send us? No, I don't know what I'm actually delivering until I listen to the parents. I actually don't prepare. Mm. Um, I We log on to Zoom, they turn up. I don't ask what's been better since we last met. I don't ask how have you been. I listen to the interaction. They start talking about, oh, my child did this or did, did, did or I'm pleased to notice this. And then I pick it up and I make it up as I go along. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. It is. It's all in and, and it works. I don't know why. It just works. Yeah. Mm. Well, they're fortunate to have you. Well, no, just, oh, thank you. But just listening no, to you saying this is brilliant. You know, you know, it's interesting, Aisha, that you say that because you say you don't prepare, but every day you working with people is a preparation work for that. Yeah. Frank yeah. has been preparing yeah. for this for 40 years, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, I've dragged a lot of train cars behind me, and there's a lot of it is. Yeah. So part of it is when you become an expert or at least a, a, someone who's very experienced in training or teaching or solution focused brief therapy or supervision, whatever it is, you really can't even explain what you're doing sometimes. I mean, the expertise literature says, uh, I, I did a session with Charlie Fishman, who was one of the originators of the structural and, and the, the structural family therapy. And uh, it was the main case in his book on eating disorders. And in the aftermath, and a question came up, how did you know to say this, to use this phrase? And Charlie said, well, um, I, I can't explain it. I just knew. And if, if you get to the point in your life where you're at, where I'm at, you'll just know too. Mm. It wasn't right. something he pre-planned. Yeah. It was it was it was years of spontaneity <laughs> mm. you know, that comes in with you. So I come in with these huge PowerPoints and I come in with you know lots of prep and you've got those in your back pocket too. Mm. And then I go into a session and I'll say, okay, uh, it's uh, we're starting at nine o'clock. It's now five o'clock. Put yourself into the future at five o'clock. What was your favorite part of the workshop today? And they start, I, they start saying things from the audience and I start writing them down. I said, okay, we're going to make sure that your favorite parts happen in the next eight hours. You know, if that's, if they said they already have a vision of what they want and what they feel would be useful or helpful, mm -hmm. I can do that. I, you know, I can't dance. I can do just about anything else, you know? Because I bring all that, as Hasten said, I just bring all that with me. Mm -hmm. and it, I don't care if it's solution focused, if it's useful. People say, let's do a, you know, let's do a, a role play of some type. Let's, let's uh, have an exercise of some type. Okay, I've got some. Let's talk about the future. You know, on a on a desert island, and here's what's happening. And let's do this and have small groups. And you know, they find it. Oh, that's brilliant. No, it was just something you suggested at the beginning. This is just a means to get there. And I've got a whole bucket full of these things that we could use. So for training, I, I hate it when someone comes in and says, the only way that this can work today is if we have PowerPoint. That happened with Insu when she came to TCU just a few months before she died. We couldn't get the video to work. And she said, that's okay. There's two, 300 people there. And she's just sitting there just fine. Just, no, that's okay. If we don't get to work, I'll, we'll do something else. Yeah. They finally got the video to work and we were able to show it, but she was not flapped at all. And I was, you know, in awe, in awe of this. So it, she's a great role model. There are others that are as well. And now I have Aisha as a role model of saying that I'm doing something that's, that's useful and it's being used elsewhere and successful in. Go watch this woman's work. You know, that's so interesting, Frank, that when we actually were talking about this, and I always actually wanted to ask you this question, because when we um, when we watch some of these videos that we watch of Insu, Steve, and often people say, that's amazing, you know, and I want to be like that. I'm sure you've seen some videos that were not that amazing mm. <laughs> of their, their practices. And those are all the prep work that doesn't get shared with the world. And I was always like curious about what are some of those like fun moments <laughs> that you actually noticed, if you can share that. Oh, bloopers? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I've seen people leave the room on Insu. Uh, several walked out on Steve, just kind of like, <sighs> didn't, didn't, didn't connect, but they kept the videos because there was something to learn from them. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it had to do with uh, asking questions that that did not get the response they expected. Um, Guy Shannon talks about amending your questions, and that's that's a real skill of being comfortable enough to say, oh, "Okay, let me ask it a different way. Let me be less specific." 
specific or more specific or use a different term or something. Um, so there was a lot where people would say, well, you know, what I'm hearing is this, and the client would just go, well, no, just flat out, you're not getting it to show all of us have those moments. If I have five or 10 minutes of good counseling in a 50 minute hour, I'm doing well. The rest of it is, you know, that's the rest of it is just like, oh, we're trying to get to someplace. You know, we're trying to get somewhere. And then there's brilliant moments that are in there that uh, sometimes happen. The rest of it is just plodding along. Um, I was trying to think of uh, one, one other team that I saw um, where they were interrupting each other. Um, it was like, well, this idea has to be taken back into the room, has to be taken back into the room. And finally, the family just said, we're leaving. They took all the time and the family had to go home. <laughs> so, so it was like, oh, oh, well, we were going to come back in. Now nah, we're done. We got to go. You know, so <laughs> the best laid plans of using the team. Um, mm. and I've had thousands of cases where I've either been behind the mirror, not cases, thousands of hours mm. behind the mirror or in front of the mirror with teams. Mm. And I saw I saw some pretty funny ones that I can't share the specifics on. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but learning cases. Yeah, John. Yeah. yeah mm. So for me, it's also and I have a question that might go in a different place, but it, it's also my curiosity about <laughs> your immersion, you know, uh, with 400 hours of, of videotape and yeah. kind of parallels from me what you know what we would hear from Steve that he, he learned so much about practice through all those hours of immersion he had in watching you know uh, therapy tapes you know and uh, he, he would often comment that you know he, he couldn't have got to where he got to if he hadn't spent that sort of time and many of us would think well I'm pleased he did it because I, I wouldn't have spent that much time doing that you know <laughs> you know however you know here are you you as the archivist did spend four hour, 400 hours plus immersing yourself yeah. um, in some of the stuff that had been seen of Insu and Steve's work, um, the therapy, uh, the consultations, their supervisions, but a great deal that hadn't been. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering what, uh, not sure how to ask the question, but, but I just have an assumption that uh, that would have changed you in some sort of way or another. Mm. Uh, 400 hour immersion of insulin steve and i don't know that many other people in the world have actually done that <laughs> um i wonder what 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 that kind of brought you to or made clear to you or changed for you or where you know what what you took from that yeah any of those questions <laughs> <laughs> now that's uh gosh it's just such such great questions and comments i, I appreciate you all you, you all have really put me in a place of uh, reflection as well. I Part of it is I've read everything Steve's ever written. I've read everything Insu's ever written. And I was doing that parallel with watching the videos because we would archive something, a paper that was never published, or the Underground Railroad, which was a newsletter that came out of the MRI of the Midwest through Steve. And um, uh, all, of, all of these things uh, had a huge impact, but they're all at the same time. So I can't separate off what I learned from video from what I learned from looking at early thinking and changes in thinking, um, especially with Steve. Um, I, th I think part of it, part of it was the pressure to um, commercialize. Uh, it's really, really saddened me. Um, Steve's interview with the young man who was in the wheelchair, who was paralyzed, is a recreation with an actor. Uh, irreconcilable differences with Insu with the uh, African American couple who are both professionals is a recreation. Uh, the family one with the adolescent is a recreation. Uh, yes, it's taken from transcripts, but there's something missing from um, being able to view things that were live counseling that has all mm. all of the blemishes, all of the ums and ahs and things. This is, and that's what's beautiful about watching it in real time. It it heartens me to watch my own work or others work and saying, that's just part of this. Um, ah, uh, well, bad question. Well, shoot, no, I missed that. You know, lots of things that are simply part of doing good therapy. It's not perfection. And mm. the commercialization was kind of sad, kind of sad when I saw it because it happened pretty late in their careers when they started putting out those commercial videos with reenactments. Uh, one of which I think was Harry Corman's case. Mm. 
it wasn't even Steve's case. So they're doing a recreation of Steve as the counselor when he wasn't the counselor. And Steve and Harry are very different, very different. Mm-hmm. The way they think and act and decisions they make and um, all of that. Um, I think uh, Steve had read everything Milton Erickson ever wrote. Uh, he had built, he had viewed every film that was available on Milton Erickson. He had heard every audio while he was at MRI. Out of that came solution-focused brief therapy. So part of this is if we don't have people immersing themselves, in other words, all they read is the textbooks on solution-focused, whatever it might be. It might be Guy Shannon or Peter and in Sue's book or whoever. If all they read are the, are the textbooks and they don't get exposed to original ideas, we're going to lose something in the next generation. We're going to have a very a lack of appreciation for the depth that somehow I can learn this quickly. Uh, I can become a master at it if I just go to enough classes, get the right certification. Uh, I can sidestep a lot of expertise development. I'll, I'll become an expert in a couple of thousand hours. Oh, please. There's Erickson's work, the, Swed- the Swedish Erickson's work on um, expertise, 10,000 hours is a minimum. And if you're flying my airplane, I don't want you flying that airplane without at least five or 10,000 hours of flying. It's the emergencies where it comes up. It's it's the uh, abuse and the, the child neglect and child abuse and the threatening situations that you train for. That five percent that you have to be aware. Hey, this can't just go the way it's going right now. This person's suicidal. They didn't use the, they didn't use the words. They didn't make the threat. I need to assess at this point. I need to go back to good sources like John Sherry, the Irish. A group that wrote on suicide, uh, Heather Fisk, John uh, Hendon, other people have written a lot, and you've got to have a depth of understanding beyond just, I'm just doing the model. So I think that's what's going to be missing from a lot of people's, um, say, 20 years from now going forward and who's leading this organization. I'm just going to say, not who did you know, what did you do to prepare for this? You know, right now, that's all I know in Sue, or I know so and so, and I know everybody. I mean, I, I just do. I just know everybody. I paid a lot of them. <laughs> I was running conferences; they all became my friends. You know, uh, that's that's true. That is actually true. Uh, yeah. I ran very very large conferences for a while, but but if you don't have that depth of exposure to ideas and faux pas and development, then yeah. you just lack a wisdom. And and our whole 20 years now, I don't know if we'll have a generation of people Mm -hmm. like John, who has immersed himself in this for a very long time and has trained and has written and has presented and has given himself to the associations. You don't have many Johns around in the next next generation (laughs) unless they immerse themselves. Love you, John. (laughs) It's it's, it's, it's a love it's a love fest. You know, John. My colleague and I my my colleague and I Matt had a a single session therapy a couple of hours ago and and uh, an eleven year old boy sat in front of us with his mum. He clearly didn't want to be here. And Matt asked him, so, so what's your name? So they said, I don't know. <laughs> so I said, um, do you mind if we call you IDK for short? <laughs> which, which then made him laugh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he just went, IDK. I said, well, I don't know. It's just yeah. so much easier if I just say IDK. Yeah, yeah. Don't you That's think? Brilliant. That's brilliant. Uh, after that he was fine because it's a test isn't it I don't know how are you going to get Mm. past I don't know Mm. well it's harder to get past well F you which is (laughs) when I when I worked with a lot of adolescents now your your nephews can watch this hey son Uh, (laughs) I worked with a lot of adolescents and substance abuse that was my training and my dissertation and research and I got told to F off a lot and I would just say it's not going to happen Mm. Yeah, F you. No. You know, mm. now what do we do? I, and, and I should that that just leads me to a great, just a beautiful story of how the person and the orientation is more important than the technique with a guy named mm. Robbie, Robbie that I had when I worked with uh, disenfranchised uh, families at an agency for about five years between my uh, my gigs in, in um, 
higher education. And Robbie came in and he was soiling his pants. He's soiling his shorts and he was hiding it. He's 14, African-American young man. His grandmother was his ward, uh, his, his adult. She said, we got to know why he's doing this. And it just started like six weeks ago. So he came in and he sat and he didn't, he didn't say a word. So we sat for 20 minutes. Sometimes I'll just pull out a book and start reading, you know, just to annoy them. But I knew this wasn't, I could tell this wasn't a point. I, he's not defying me. He can't tell me. Mm. I said, so, okay, we're, we're done for today, uh, but you have to come back because we got to figure this out. The third time he came back, we went to shoot hoops, we went to shoot basketball. And he had a terrible jump shot. So I was helping him with that. Just he was falling all over the place. He didn't have any, <laughs> he didn't have any coaching. I mean, anybody who's played basketball and had good coaches knows the basics. And and he enjoyed that. The fourth time he came back, he came back with a mixtape and, and put it in the boom box and turned it on. And all of a sudden he's rapping. And he's doing the boom box, the, 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 the noises himself. And his friend is talking about girls and Dallas and cars and stuff. And I said, wow, this, wow, this is great. I crank it up. Counselors are coming out of their offices telling me to turn it down. I'm going, no, Robbie brought this in. No. So we're listening to this. And at the end of that time, he shut it off. He took a big breath and he said, well, my, my cousin is in TYC, Texas Youth Commission. He's in prison. And he's coming. He's getting out next week. And when he lived with me and my grandmother, he, he raped me. He abused me. Mm -hmm. So the metaphor of him soiling himself mm. was just at that moment. I mean, the lights just went on. So he and I sat there and I said, so what's our next step? He said, I, I got to tell my grandma. Mm. Okay. Do you want me there? You want to do it? I mean, it was totally his wisdom and his timing. Mm. His grandma came in and said, there's no way this kid's moving back in my house. He gets out of jail. He's on his own. I mean, you don't know American black grandmas that you just don't understand. <laughs> that this nothing is going to happen that she doesn't control and have a say in and she's going to take charge. He quit soiling his pants that week. Wow. I mean, just wow. stopped. And, and, but it was his wisdom of when to say something. When is it safe enough? Is this somebody that might be able to help me? Mm. And I wasn't forcing it. That's to me, a solution mm. focused is learn from your client. Take your hints from your client. Mm. What's the timing here? We're in no rush. He's going to poop his pants, whether he's with me or not. He's been doing it for weeks. So, it doesn't have to end overnight. We don't have to have an outcome today. And he came up with, I, I need to tell my grandma. Because he knew that she was the one who could do something about it to bring about a different outcome. Mm -hmm. That's just one of the, the brilliance of clients. They're, they're heroic, as Scott Miller and Barry Duncan and Mark Hubble wrote about. And uh, I just really believe in them, uh, their resources, their expertise about themselves, their limits, what they can't do. And I'm there to learn. Mm -hmm. Hope that, hope that resonates with, uh, with y'all and with anyone who watches this. I'm feeling a bit emotional. I don't feel emotional at all. I'm usually quite a hot that's not, person. That's not allowed in solution focus. No emotions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just behavior. Stop Look it. at the behavioral Stop changes. It. Yeah, why are you leaking? Why are your eyes <laughs> I, it, It's just so inspiring because I, I have a lot of respect for Hayson and John and I know they absolutely mm. agree with you because, you know, they are of the same mind. And it's just so inspiring to just listen to you. Oh, just, thank you. It, it mm. A, confirms that Joe and I are on the right track. We've still got a long way oh, to go, but we're on good. the right track. But good. also hearing it from someone like you, I just think, wow. You know, it's. I hope the people watching today or, or thereafter really, really do take a step back and reflect on their own practice or, yeah. or their own listening, homing in in their own listening schools as parents yeah. to see what difference that makes. As partners, as yeah. co workers, as peers, as, yeah. All of those. You know, what I'm taking away from here, Frank, is actually much deeper than I actually thought. <laughs> mm. And I think I often, I mean, especially these days when social media, they just, you know, microwave stuff. And then, you know, the five key things that you need to know. And I think when, when actually learners come in the room, they somehow, they're conditioned to like, look for what are the five things or what are this? And I've been sort of 
uh, fighting this sort of fight with myself, like, do I then pose it like microwave version here? Or mm. what do I do? But I am really walking away with this idea of how do I actually create the crock pot where people are immersed? It's not microwave, but how do we create that crock pot in classrooms? That's what I'm walking away with. Thank you so much for that. That's a great mm. metaphor. That's a great metaphor. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and if I could say also, because actually the way my screen is, you know, have you, Frank, you know, full image, and then there's this line, you know, the four of the rest of us. Yeah. It's, it's really quite quite spooky because the only person who's missing from the team that was going to present at the conference is Naomi. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> and, and we are meeting again. We've got, we've got a date scheduled, so the five of us will meet, and this notion oh, of equanimity, great. you know, how do we, in mm. the crock pot, as you say, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, how, how do we encourage that? You know, how, how, how do we support, sustain, create environments when that can be in place? You oh, know, ooh. you know, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. I've learned. I've learned more from John Wheeler in the last five years than he possibly could have learned from me. I, oh. I know. No, that's that's a, that's absolutely honest. I, I look forward so much to meeting with John, but. Uh, part of it is I get to listen most of the time when, when mm. we're spending time together. This just my role is to listen. It's not to mm. tell. You know? <laughs> and um, mm. so I'm, I'm really, really honored that both you and my favorite all-time Canadian. <laughs> hey, hey, son, it's great, great to make new friends, Joe. I yeah, should, uh, great to meet you. And I, I so I'm really honored to be number 99. Yeah, oh, yeah, number yeah, ninety nine. Yeah, in so we we in, actually kick started FBS chats with Guy Shannon. Oh, yeah, yeah. in the solution focus uh, FBS chats. Bookend, bookend. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm reading. I I uh, endorse Guy's first edition uh, of his oh, book, wow. and the second edition is out now, and I'm rereading it because I'm teaching it. And gosh, the <laughs> wisdom! Oh, the wisdom! The students are loving mm. reading him. And so, yeah, I'm really honored to be the bookends with, with Guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what your time says or when you need to end. I don't Well, honestly... I'm just, any, any last words from you, Frank or Joe, and then we'll say goodbye to everybody and have a very quick, Frank, do you need to go when you're in a rush or have you got a minute afterwards? No, I we get paid say... either way. I get paid the same <laughs> either way. <laughs> God, I love you. Yeah. Uh, any yeah. last words from, from Joe? Uh, or uh, anyone else, I know you guys have, but if you want my, to add to um, it. It's, I, I, love, I love these chats. This this one, my my cheeks are aching because I keep, I, not wanting to laugh, but just smiling at at how, um, how wonderful this has been because remembering what you were saying about that young man and the, a young man that I used to work with who used to say, why do you keep coming here? Don't, I don't want to listen to what you've got to say. You're, blah 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 and all i used to say to him was i'm not i'm not going to give up on you and walk yeah. out and every week it was the same and when he was in real problems he he came he came to me for help and i think we we need to bear in mind as as practitioners whatever we call ourselves that the changes may not happen immediately but they're going to remember those conversations with you yeah. so make them count yeah. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. For, it's been brilliant, mate. Thank you so much. Oh, I, lo I love. I absolutely loved it. I, I will only leave with one word of wisdom from a client. I actually wrote an article uh, with her as part of it. In a, you know, her her post treatment interview was so revealing of what she said I did that we need to spend more time asking, "How was this? How are you? And how are we?" Those are the three. Uh, yeah. Questions from John Norcross. You don't have to do uh, the stuff that, that John John Wheeler does. He does the, does the SRS with clients and things. You can just be simple. Just how are you at the end of the session? How are we? And how was this? Very mm -hmm. simple things to learn. She said, "You believed in me before I believed in me," and that is, I have taken that forward mm -hmm. tw twenty or thirty years, twenty yeah. years at least, for a woman mm -hmm. who was just in a horrible situation in life as well as in her health. I believe you, I, I believe mm. if, if there is a pile of manure, there's a pony in there somewhere. 
<laughs> that's my approach. And she said it to me in a way I could never say it better. You believed in me before I believed in me. And that's 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 essential to being a good counselor. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave that. I'll leave that. And just thanks so much for the, the privilege of being with you. I'm looking forward to going back and watching others. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Some fantastic comments from you guys, from Ella, from Elaine, from Michelle, quite a few, which we'll go back and read later on. Um, and our next FBS chat is on Friday night. Um, it won't be live. Uh, you will be able to catch up on YouTube, but you do need Eventbrite tickets to uh, join us. Um, it will be David Haynes, uh, Naomi Whitehead, uh, oh. And Gil. Gil Green, because it was <laughs> Gil Green, Gil. Yeah. Gil. I love you, Green. I love you. 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 I love you, Gil. I love you, Gil. I love you, Gil, so much, so much. Um, <laughs> we'll Great. be hosting the chat and Joe and I will be in the hot seat uh, and then we'll be having a quiz night. Yay, mm. let's see uh, who's the most competitive of us all. Um, after that, we have Katrine Berger from uh, joining us next Wednesday. Uh, so that should be a lot of fun talking about solution focus in education. Until then, have a lovely evening. Can I ask you guys to just wait there for a minute while we say au revoir? Uh, and to the rest of you, have a good evening, morning or afternoon. Thank you.